everyone. My name is Olivia with RedmondMag.com, and I'd like to thank you all so much for joining us today. The topic of today's webcast is Digital Resiliency Strategies for Application Infrastructure in a Hybrid Cloud World, and we are so thankful to have it sponsored by A10 Networks. But before we begin, I'd like to cover a few important housekeeping details. We will have a Q&A session today at the end of today's presentation, so do not hesitate to pop your questions into the audience Q&A box. We'll take those right at the end. Additionally, A10 Networks has provided some phenomenal resources which correspond with today's event. So take a moment to check those out on your resources list on the right-hand side of your screen. Finally, today's webcast is being recorded, so keep an eye out for a link to rewatch the presentation or share it with a colleague. It should be emailed to you over the next few days. And finally, I'd like to introduce you to our two speakers. We are in for a phenomenal presentation with these two. First up, we'll hear from Howard M. Cohen, the senior resultant at the Tech Channel Partners Results Group. And following Howard, we'll get to hear from Paul Nicholson, Senior Director of Product Marketing of A10 Networks. So like I said, we're in for a really great event today. And with that, I'll pass the time over to Howard to get us started. Thank you very much, Olivia. This is Howard M. Cohen, and I'm, as Olivia mentioned, I am a senior resultant for uh, the Tech Channel Partners Results Group. Uh, I've been in the IT channel for 40 years. I actually came in with the IBM PC in August of 1981. Um, enough about me. We're here today to talk about conquering cloud cost, control, and complexity challenges. Uh, cloud has become pretty much the standard, uh, the way in which we all deliver IT services. Uh, as we move more and more to cloud, um, we try to make it better and better. And of course, with great power, comes great responsibility, so we need to figure out how to keep it all under control. There's one word that I'd like to uh, start off with because it's so frequently used, and sometimes I think it's somewhat misunderstood. Uh, so to get a definition of it, I've gone to the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, if you haven't read their definition of cloud computing, they wrote the original. It's four pages long. It is absolutely worth the time invested to read it. Uh, it will give you a much better understanding of what everyone's trying to do with cloud. Uh, but one of the words that keep coming up is the word hybrid. Um, and so I look for their definition, and they say that it's uh, two or more distinct cloud infrastructures, public, private, or they list community clouds that remain unique but they're bound together by technology. Um, and and that's, you know, that's, a fair, that's a fair definition. Uh, here's the thing, the way I see it, everything is hybrid. I mean, what isn't hybrid? We're still in the midst of transitioning. Uh, very few companies have gone all the way hybrid. So at the very least, uh, we're a hybrid of on-premises systems and public cloud systems. Uh, maybe some hybrid of on-prem, public, and private cloud even. Uh, maybe even more. Maybe some of us have now moved to multi-cloud. Multi-cloud. Um, what's the difference? What is the difference between hybrid and multi-cloud? If everything is hybrid, what is multi-cloud? And the hint is that every hybrid is multi-cloud. You have multiple clouds. You may have a few public clouds. You may have a few private clouds that you're using. Um, but every multi-cloud is not hybrid. Okay, multi-cloud denotes that you're using the same infrastructure of cloud. Um, you're using, for example, three or four public clouds. And one of the great advantages of cloud is that you can integrate various cloud services, bring them together uh, to form a greater system. In fact, today's integrator differs from the original integrator in that in, in the beginning, we integrated different hardware and different software from various different manufacturers and publishers, and we made better solutions out of them. Today, um, we're still doing some of that, but more and more we're combining services 
cloud services, cloud delivered services from a variety of different cloud providers. Uh, and so multi-cloud is used to denote that we're using more than one of the same kind of cloud. So let me give you the grand example. The grand example is Oracle, Azure, and AWS. Okay, they're all similar. They all are hyperscalers, they're huge. Uh, they all offer a huge number of services. Uh, they all offer virtual machines. You can get virtual machines configured the way you want, with the storage you want, the operating system you want, the database engine you want. Um, and then you can just sim simply use those as you see fit. So once you have multi-cloud, the thing you have to acknowledge is that you need to manage multi-cloud. And that's not simple. Um, it's it, it's kind of like when you went from on-prem to cloud, it was different. And when you go to multi-cloud, it's different once again, but it doesn't exist in the vacuum. In addition to having multiple hyperscalers, you may also be using the internet of things. You may be deploying sensors and switches and controls and all kinds of far-flung places along the edge of the internet. Um, the internet is exploding. There are billions upon billions of sensors and controls being deployed all over the planet and elsewhere um, that are all connected into the global internet. And that's got a lot of management implications that we could go into in a session all its own. Um, in addition, we're now seeing the advent of 5G, the fifth generation of wireless. Uh, this one's going to be somewhat different in that it's supposed to be latency free, no delays, no burps. So, you know, we'll, we, jury's out. We, we'll see if that actually happens. Uh, also, the world is becoming more mobile. Uh, so we have to manage our mobile fleet and all the people who are using it and all the applications and data they're using. Of course, all of this needs to be secured. Um, we can't have outsiders getting to our data because they'll corrupt it, steal it, use it, who knows? So security is a critical concern that we have to manage. Another thing that we have to manage, another kind of hybrid network, is the change from the original IPv4 IP addressing scheme to IPv6, going from four clusters of um, four clusters of three digits each for an eight-bit word, going out to a 128-bit word. Um, th that's a huge address, 128. So, um, big change there. And everybody's in the midst of that to some extent. Some haven't begun yet. Some have a hybrid of both. Some may have already finally made it to IPv6. According to um, ICANN and IANA, the authorities that manage these things, we're supposed to get there by April of 2011, so we're 10 years late. That's not bad. And then finally, we need to manage applications. Uh, and managing applications is a, a huge responsibility. Uh, we have to manage the delivery of them. We have, to we have to manage the fact that they're hardened so nobody can get into them and use them for their own purposes. Uh, there, there's a lot to do in managing, just managing applications alone. So when you look at all of this, it should be comforting to know that you've got all of this to do it with. Uh-oh. <laughs> well, the data center's empty. We've moved everything to the cloud. And therein lies the rub. Um, we have to manage more, but we're going to have less on-prem uh, customer premises equipment. Um, for a lot of people, that's that's a little frustrating. but. The good news is that there are solutions, and we'll be reviewing some of those later today. So since we've emptied out the data center, it's vacant, and we've moved everything to the clouds, Azure, Oracle, Amazon, um, it might be worthwhile to take a look at what we're getting for the move. So some of the advantages of moving everything to cloud over time 
is that, especially with multi-cloud, you get the choice of the best in class in everything. Now, you look at the three of them. If you have all three connected into your cloud network, you can choose which one you want for Kubernetes, which one you want to manage your DevOps, which one you want to run your databases on or other applications. You, you can evaluate all three and decide which one does it best. Uh, of course, best also includes most cost effective. Which one does it for the best possible price? And here's the thing about that, and we'll talk more about it. That's constantly changing. There's competition going on here. These three are, you know, competing against each other all the time. Good for you, because it drives prices down. Of course, when you have all three, there's no way you can get locked into any one vendor. Vendors are very good at making you dependent upon them. They want to be as sticky as they possibly can be, so you just can't get them out of there. Well, now you've got all three, and if one disserves you or fails you, you can move a lot of your applications to another. Um, so that flexibility is fantastic. Um, you can optimize your performance. Whichever one does it best, that's the one you're going to use. This provides you with improved agility and improved flexibility. You can make a lot more decisions here to improve upon the performance of your overall system and to improve upon the price performance of it as well. You also get increased resilience. There's no reason you can't create failover scenarios here so that if one of the hyperscalers for some reason experiences an outage, which I know that just never happens, but if one of them does experience an outage, you can rig to fail over to another so that you can continue working while they resolve their problems. So that spells increased resilience. Also, each of these three is supposedly infinitely elastic. Well, that means that you get three times infinite elasticity. You get a lot, it, it's, it's very elastic. You can scale however you need to. Uh, and simply by requesting more resources, there's no hardware to install, there's nothing to buy, there's nothing to configure, you just tell it what you want and off you go. Um, there are some situations, you may not have encountered these yet, hopefully, uh, but over time you may, where compliance with local or federal or state law, other regulations, um, may require you to work in a multi-cloud environment. Uh, if it's not happening yet, wait. Um, you also get, and this is interesting, superior security and risk mitigation. Why do I say that? Uh, looking at the three companies, Microsoft, Oracle, and Amazon, name three bigger companies. You really can't. Um, name three companies with deeper pockets who can invest more in security than these three can. And there are very few, if any. So the good news is you benefit from that. They can invest way more than any of us could possibly invest, and so you get the benefit of that. Also, you enjoy the best of innovation. I said before that they're competing on price. They're also competing on technology. They're all trying to be your best choice of cloud provider. And so they're constantly improving upon the way in which they do things. Better database engines, faster. Um, all kinds of new introductions. So uh, you get the benefit of the best of innovation from the best innovators in the industry. Okay, so what are the disadvantages? What's the downside? Well, there is increased management complexity, more clouds, more management. Uh, each of these has its own management consoles, its own management schema. Um, you need to learn them. You need to figure out how you're going to work with them. You need to figure out how you're going to work with them in combination. Um, that will also bring you increased traffic management challenges. But is, you know, every time a packet moves from one cloud to another, that's a danger zone. That's something that you have to monitor carefully and make sure it's happening correctly. 
And you have to continue to do that over time. We're living in the era of zero trust. Nothing is trusted. Everything must prove itself. So that's good. Now, the concept of visibility. Anybody who's ever managed any network knows if you can't see it, you can't manage it. So you want to be able to see everything. And in a multi-cloud environment with multiple consoles, multiple schema, you're going to have to look in multiple places to see what's going on. That's difficult. You know, you much prefer to have it all in that proverbial one pane of glass. That would be great. And, and also, when they're in multiple different places, it's really hard to compare them to each other. You know, most often you want to see which is performing better, or, or how is this a change in this affecting the condition of that. And, you know, that, that's a context. You're, you're trying to bring everything that's happening into context so you can see everything in the context of everything else. That's difficult when you're checking multiple consoles all the time to do that. You'd much prefer to bring it all together. We're also living in a time where it's no longer enough to be monitoring and managing. It's got to be really one thing. You've got to be very rapid in your ability to locate an, an anomaly, identify what it is and what's causing it, uh, and resolve it right then and there. I mean, there's no time to wait. You know, we're moving at the speed of light, and we've got to manage at the speed of light. So your tooling has to be able to see where, where it is, see what it is, and know how to fix it, fix it right then and there. However, you're trying to do that while juggling multiple management consoles. Very tricky, very difficult. You also have the interesting challenge of trying to um, load balance, not just between various engines and various storage, but also between multiple clouds. Uh, and you can, I mean, you're able to balance your load, um, but it's going to take some learning. It's going to take some sophistication. Um, so it's somewhat of a disadvantage because it's very difficult. Uh, I'm sure it'll get easier very quickly, uh, but we're still living in that time where some of these things are still developing. So you may consider load balancing between clouds to be an advantage. Again, just as the management consoles vary, security varies. Each one has its own specifications. Each one has its own requirements. Each one has its own idiosyncrasies. You have to learn them all. And you have to be able to determine which of them is at the root cause of any particular anomaly. That's challenging. Um, also, since you have three different environments, you need three different skill sets. Um, they do not manage identically. They do not operate identically. And so you need people who either know all three, which are super valuable people, super expensive people, or you need to have enough people to cover all three or more. Um, and, you know, whichever way you go, it's an expensive proposition. People are a big expense in this environment, and let's hope it stays that way because we want an environment in which people – remain in control. And here's the thing that a lot of people don't think about. You want to have a financial manager on your team. Uh, why? Because you need to make sure somebody's keeping track of all the changes that are happening. Um, you know, the, the prices are changing constantly. And you may have thought that Azure had the most cost uh, effect effective solution for database engine. And then all of a sudden, Amazon makes this big announcement, or Amazon makes this not so big announcement. Somebody's got to catch it. And somebody's got to, because there's going to be somebody in finance who's watching. And they're going to catch you spending more unnecessarily, even though the price just changed. You want to stay in front of that. You want to make sure that you're using the most cost effective and the most effective solution possible as you're choosing from the various different clouds. Another thing, and those of you who purchase from multiple resources, from multiple sources, 
know that is the more you purchase from one source, the better volume discount you get. Well, the same is true here. You can reserve instances and you know, really bring your costs down by doing so. Uh, and the more instances you reserve in advance, the better your pricing will be. Well, if you're reserving instances in all three, you're spreading the wealth, which means you may not qualify for all of the available discounts. It's a sacrifice you make to have more flexibility, more agility, so forth. Also, that means that it's very difficult to continuously maintain the utmost cost control. You've got to stay on top of price changes. Um, you've got to stay on top of where the discounts are being lost and determine which is the better way to go. There's a lot of strategic decisions to be made. Um, as I hope you've seen from what we've done so far, it's a, it's a complex kind of environment. Um, I can see that we're kind of running out the clock, so I'm going to just jump through and put all four of these up. It's worthwhile to do a SWOT analysis of your cloud environment, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats analysis. Standard kind of analysis that we do all over technology. Um, but in terms of strengths, do you have the financial resources? Do you have the right people? Are your applications leveraging Hey everyone, this is Olivia just jumping in. It looks like we lost Howard's connection. We're going to get him right back and connected with you all and get us joined back going right away. And as a friendly reminder, it's a great time to go ahead and pop in your questions in the Q&A. We'll get to those at the end of the presentation, so don't hesitate to take some time to just go ahead and, and get those going in. Additionally, it's always good to check out those resources in the right-hand side of your screen. You will not want to miss the great resources that A10 was kind enough to provide. And we'll just give one more moment for Howard. And then if we can always jump into Paul to Let's, Paul, let's go ahead and jump into your presentation, then we can jump back to Howard to finish his out maybe a little bit later before we go into the Q&A. No problem. So you, you were demonstrating this is really a live webinar, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, I'll jump into it because uh, I think Howard made a lot of his good points, and he was towards the end anyway. So I'm Paul Nicholson at A10 Networks, and I'm going to be talking about digital resiliency and how that helps with digital transformation, which um, builds on what Howard was talking about earlier. So, first of all, you know, when we look at the definition of this, you know, business transfer, sorry, digital transformation is often referred to as DX. And uh, when we look at uh, digital uh, transformation, it's really about business transformation and how we deliver value to our customers. And if we look at what's been happening over the last 30 years, we know things have been accelerating. And there was a couple of slides uh, recently that Warren Buffett talked about at a Berkshire Hathaway conference where he asked uh, the audience how many of the largest top 20 market cap companies in 1989 were still the top market cap companies today. And the results actually kind of surprised me, which is why I included it in the presentation, because it was basically zero when we looked at it. And, you know, looking at some of these names, some of them are very well known, but we can also see this uh, across uh, multiple industries, this disruption out there, which is basically digital transformation. And some of the very well known names where this happens to us in our daily life are things like Uber and Netflix. Uh, you know, obviously Uber's revolutionized trans transportation, Netflix has revolutionized 
revolutionized uh, how we consume video content. But from a work point of view, as IT professionals, we can often see that there's other factors out there like Microsoft Azure. If we look at that versus where Microsoft was, say, 10, 15, 20 years ago, is very different from a uh, infrastructure software and desktop software type of company into providing these vast cloud data centers Howard was talking about earlier. And then we can also see there's other innovation. Uh, Howard also mentioned 5G is one of the major trends. Uh, we look at SKT, uh, which really recently launched the first commercial 5G services, just edging out some of the others, uh, I think by a day even, um, in Korea. And you know, they're, they're gaining steam and these types of services are giving these companies a competitive advantage. So, you know, there's a quote from IDC, which I like here, which is, um, you know, they're actually making an intersection between the idea of digital resiliency and digital transportation, uh, digital transformation um, out there. And when we look at digital resiliency, this is the concept of how organizations can respond to disruption by using these technologies, which might be part of their digital transformation efforts out there. And when we look at some of the, you know, the factors out there, some of the disruption we have isn't just from um, regular business uh, tides, as it were, as it were, but it's also from things like COVID-19. I mean, IT teams having to rapidly change to be able to deliver remote access to their uh, employees was obviously a big thing uh, during the early days of the pandemic and today, I guess, too, right? So with digital resiliency, um, you know, this basically enables a trans trans digital transformation and allows organizations to uh, respond to support the business. And when we look at it from a technology point of view, the things which are really helping with digital resiliency to empower it are things like automation and agility, uh, being able to provide security so that it's predictable in our day-to-day -day operations, et cetera, being able to deliver a superior, superior user experience. Uh, we've all been on websites where if it's too slow, we just go somewhere else. So if we get, something, get to something via a Google search and it doesn't respond, you know, we're probably going to Google again and find something else, right? So being able to um, you know, deliver that fast user experience is essential for any website property and business out there. And then we also have to deal with these change catalysts. And we've already touched on them a little bit because, you know, there's many out there, to be honest. Uh, but some of the top ones which are affecting IT systems today are things like the increase in IoT devices. Um, if I look like 10 years back in my own household, or maybe there's a couple of devices which were connected, now it's like 30-odd. Right, and it could be way higher than that because I probably haven't been counting recently. Uh, so IoT is a major trend, and we know that these devices are effectively computers out there which could be used for good or nefarious intent. Uh, we have the shift to cloud, uh, which you know Howard was talking extensively about previously. Uh, this brings its own set of challenges, and then also we have 5G deployment, which is has started but it, we're probably not at the apex of this yet. And when we think of 5G, the potential impact on IT systems and security systems can be quite high. And looking at these changes, you know, and these things, how they could impact digital resiliency and digital transformation initiatives, this uh, quote from CIO.com was interesting because what they're noting here is that the increased levels of complexity might be an even more uh, critical issue than the actual systems that we're having to maintain, you know, the legacy systems or, you know, um, inertia out there to uh, making change. So just this complexity with this multi-cloud environment, um, if you're running multiple clouds, we know this can be a potential issue. And we did a survey uh, with the BPI network, and we asked uh, the organizations how many clouds uh, they had, and most said two or more clouds, and also a follow-up question was, how successful have you been with uh, managing these environments? And only 11% said they were highly successful. So we know there's a lot of work here and there's a lot of um, items which could be done to improve uh, how we uh, manage and deliver these clouds. And part of this is because of, you know, it's, it's still fairly new for a lot of organizations. And, you know, managing the security, having the staff to deal with it, uh, and just dealing with this complexity, like it said in the CIO uh, quote, is really going to be the key for a lot of organizations. Now, we're talking about hybrid cloud and complexities here. So what we also want to do is just show um, 
you know, what uh, some of the concerns are for some companies, because it really does vary by what type of company you are. So I've got a couple of slides on here from some surveys uh, last uh, late last year. And the first one here is for e-commerce, the next one is for finance. But you can see in here that the top three vote getters, as it were, in this multiple uh, selection option, were, are around automation, consistency in delivering uh, the applications in the clouds, consistency in delivering the security services, uh, that centralized management and analytics which go along with it. Now, sure, there's, there's some out here with still quite high scores, but you can see the modernization um, to be able to uh, control the environment is key. And we see a similar thing when we look at the finance um, uh, results. So, you know, the top two here are around that. But obviously, in certain verticals, certain things are more important. So uh, when we look at finance, you know, compliance is always uh, top of mind with most of the customers we speak to. So, you know, you can see in the third and fourth places here, we can see concerns about DDoS protection, concerns about um, upgrading their uh, TLS or transport layer security or, you know, secure socket layer as it's uh, colloquially known uh, nowadays is um, one of the, the, some of the big security concerns that organizations have. And this is obviously because of some of the upgrades in the technology over the last few years with perfect forward secrecy and the elliptical curve encryption, which has you know, become the de facto standard out there. So, um, you know, the big thing we're trying to, trying to show here is this, um, concern about the management and being able to see what's going on and being able to control these disparate environments is top of mind uh, in most of the data we receive back. Uh, but there are these differences with the uh, security, for example, in the finance vertical. Now, we have these uh, catalysts we talked about before. So really what's driving change for today's IT uh, departments out there? And obviously the shift to cloud is one of them, actually having to deal with that. And then operationalizing that and trying to take away the complexity through automation is one of the key things organizations are trying to do. And then also dealing with this increased number of security threats. Because when we look at IoT devices, they are creating some of the biggest threat vectors we've seen out there, whether they're being co-opted into botnets. Uh, I mean, we can look recently at the uh, MOZI, M-O-I-Z, uh, botnet. That's actively targeting CVEs, uh, you know, known vulnerability, vulnerabilities in many popular devices out there, D-Links and others, et cetera. So, you know, being able to, being aware of these threats, being able to deal with them automatically is a real key thing uh, to be able to do today. Now, just to give, also give you some statistics on this, uh, you know, to back up some of the items we were talking about earlier, you know, we talked about user experience. And, you know, in one survey here, it says 46% of users don't revisit poorly uh, performing websites. When we look at 5G, um, you know, there's going to be a lot more connected devices out there, not just phones, but items which are using that network to communicate back. So right now, or sorry, one uh, estimate for smartphones is 4.3 billion by 2023. But that's probably just the tip of the, uh, the iceberg. We also know on the cloud side, 70% of businesses are planning to uh, spend more. Uh, for there, and also 87% of enterprises have implemented hybrid clouds. So, so these things are actually actually reality and not theory uh, today, as I'm sure most of you know. Now, there's a couple of uh, examples we have from our customers of how they're um, addressing these types of challenges. I'm just going to highlight a couple here, the ones which I've bolded. So, for example, we have an airline in Latin America who is going to a hybrid strategy. And one way they're doing, they're trying to reduce the complexity is by using the traditional on-premises solutions where it makes sense, but also moving to the Oracle cloud infrastructure and then using a common management plane between the two. So even though they're operating in two different clouds, they can push the same policies to those clouds and uh, have the same visibility into those clouds. So that's a good example of trying to reduce that complexity out there. We have another company, um, a technology company in Silicon Valley, which they were looking at, you know, the primary reason they were looking to do an upgrade uh, was because they're looking at um, 
updating their TLS decryption environment. So they're doing SSL offload uh, for their websites, but they had to get new equipment to be able to support the new protocols. They're also looking at improving their security so they could provide um, uh, more robust authentication uh, into those before users get to the app. So they can request authentication before their connection even touches the back end uh, website by getting that authentication on the application delivery controller, which can just eliminate a whole series of threats because you're not even talking to the back end application. But the, one of the reasons they selected our company for the upgrade over the competitor was we actually had a containerized solution with the same management interface as the hardware solutions, as the, the hypervisor-based editions, and containerized for their future plans. So again, they were looking at how could they simplify their environment for the future. Uh, another one we have, which I'll talk a little bit more about later on a, on a relevant slide, is a retail customer who needed, and in this case, they were looking at one of our security solutions. But you know, what they wanted to do was replace all the different pizza boxes they had um, for a particular solution. And you know, they basically decided to go with a, um, virtual, a hardware platform with a hypervisor-based solution where they could spin up, uh, for example, up to eight Technically, they could do more, but it's recommended eight, up to eight different instances of the software they needed. So that way, they didn't have to uh, go and buy a, a new server uh, for every single uh, deployment of the infrastructure application they were they were deploying out there. So you can see there's organizations are looking at how they're trying to simplify these environments, and. When we look at these, let's actually also delve into some of the top trends we're seeing in the hybrid environment for these organizations, which are kind of touched in on that, on, on that last slide. So the first one is leveraging uh, the hybrid cloud effectively. You know, the challenge on here is, as Howard was saying earlier, is there's dispar these, these applications are disparate. They have different features, they have different functionality, um, they require people to learn them, you need experts in different things. So trying to um, you know, reduce that complexity is key because it can reduce the number of staff you need. It, so it can re re reduce the amount of training you need to do and uh, help with those operational complexities, which you know, obviously in an IT department, you're going to have some people who are very experienced, some people who are less experienced. So just trying to reduce that is going to reduce human error and there's potential issues out there. So the way to deal with this is to basically look at modern application delivery techniques. If you're looking at your, app, your web application delivery infrastructure or application delivery infrastructure and think of the ways where you can simplify it. And it could be from the multi-cloud management and reporting. It could also be through licensing or um, it could also be for how you could automate things with APIs out there, which is becoming you know, the new lingo franco of uh, the, um, the IT uh, ex the IT uh, professional today. And we've encompassed some of these changes which uh, you can use to, uh, you know, with modern application de delivery infrastructure to be able to achieve this. So we've, th these can range from using more flexible licensing where you don't have to get a new PO when you want to use something, say, on a container versus bare metal versus a hypervisor solution versus a cloud marketplace solution from, say, AWS or Azure or whatever it might be, um, and many others. But the ones I'm going to concentrate on today are the three which are bolded in here. So the first one is you know, getting a full secure services stack. So when you move to the cloud, you should not compromise your security or your features when you move to there. The, the requirements you had for your on-prem solution are just the same as they are, in, they are in the cloud. So looking at a solution which offers all the right features so you don't get locked into the wrong environment uh, is key. Having centralized management where you can manage uh, the same solution in the cloud, say in AWS or Oracle or on-prem makes makes the solution a lot simpler for your team because you can push the same policies out and know that you, know, you have that same level of security or you have that same application delivery experience for your end users. The central visibility and reporting obviously ties into this because you're know, pushing the policies and having the same security services is one thing, but also having that centralized visibility and reporting and also applying 
um, connected intelligence to this is key. So one simple example, uh, which I'll show you a screenshot of later, is where you can you know, visualize what, what traffic is coming in on a dashboard, but also then use geolocation so that it can automatically, without your manual intervention, show you where you're, you're seeing spikes in traffic. And that could indicate an attack. It could indicate a successful marketing promotion. Um, it could potentially you know show a marketing promotion nobody told you about and they should have so you know, having that centralized visibility and reporting can help um, with that digital resiliency whether it's from a security point of view or responding to legitimate business needs now another one which I briefly just touched on the last slide, last uh, slide or so is the continuous integration and continuous delivery and when we look at this type of solution um, we know that uh, automation is key automation is going to reduce the human error out there and increase the velocity. Um, you, we can look at simple examples uh, of, say, IT staff being uh, given specific uh, commands in um, homegrown management consoles, as an example, where you know maybe the uh, senior uh, senior infrastructure team wants them to do certain actions, but they don't want to give them full management control. So, using APIs to um, do specific tasks when certain um, conditions are met is is one great example. But it could be a lot more complicated uh, elements as well, from gathering reporting uh, through to doing procedures related to whatever challenges happened on that given day. So that's one thing from an IT, t IT point of view. Also, we know that the, the dev teams out there who are actually pushing code could be pushing 10, 20, 30, 100 updates a day out to their website to support the business um, out there. So being able to um, match the infrastructure to the uh, website velocity is very key for a lot of organizations. Uh, that way they can also spin up and spin down services as they need to to uh, meet whatever demand and also you know, control costs and cloud environments as well. Now, I'll give you an example of this, uh, which is around hybrid cloud management and operational flexibility. And this was a customer of ours, Delta Dental, and I love the quote uh, on here, which is, you know, we like to work smarter, not harder. They modernized their application delivery environment and basically wanted to give a single pane of um, glass and management and also uh, uh, overcome automation challenges which they had within their organization and this was the IT team they they had their DevOps team uh, which was running the website serving millions of subscribers um, which were pushing out codes very frequently so you know the dilemma there was how do you actually get you know empower, help empower the DevOps team uh, on a day-to-day -day basis but also make sure you keep your IT infrastructure for your regular applications going at the same time so they upgraded their uh, application delivery environment, but they also uh, deployed the A10 Harmony controller to help them with this. And the difference with having the Harmony controller, which was not in the environment before, was it helped give increased agility to the DevOps team because they could actually go into a console and, see, and have a partition view of what's going on and see what was happening after they did a code push. So they could do that update to the content on the website, and then they could see if there's any errors. They could see if there was a 404 page not found error you know, in near real time. So the, it basically uh, took out the errors uh, from there, but it also showed when they were being successful uh, or they saw a uh, better result from a code push in uh, a very quick manner. So this uh, you know, obviously helps that digital resiliency out there. And it took away the manual side of it. So I thought this was a very good example. And one thing I also wanted to show just to make this um, uh, more, bring it to a, a more real level, visceral level, was just a couple of screenshots from this type of solution. Because we're talking about modernizing the environment and the infrastructure. And if you look back, say, you know, five, even six years ago, you know, typically when you looked at the uh, load balancing or application delivery environment, you could just see the number of connections coming into a web server and it wasn't that useful and it was very hard to troubleshoot people could blame the load balancer and you couldn't really defend yourself very easily without a lot of log digging etc now there's the tools out there where you this information is presented to you and you could rapidly drill down 
uh, into it. And also information is overlaid on it to make life easier for you. So for example, you see the map here, which I was referring to earlier, and we can light up areas depending on what's happening out there. And if you see an error, you can double click on it and drill down into that area to see what's going on. You can even see down to the page level right of what's going on so which object is uh creating a particular uh occurrence in the dashboard right which is very different from just the connection counts which you used to see in the past and when you go to these environments like azure or uh oracle um and also you have bare metal and containerized environments being able to have this at your fingertips is very very powerful the other thing uh, Howard mentioned this earlier as well is zero trust. And when we look at zero trust, I mean, back in the day, I used to say trust but verify, and the trust thing was very important because you wouldn't let, you let someone do something without trusting them with a particular policy. But you know, I think what's got much better mind share right now is this idea of zero trust, um, which is a similar type of concept, which is under the maxim, never trust, always verify. And th the idea here is to remove implicit trust for anything in the network and that the perimeter has disappeared. So every device user network application flow needs to be secured um, and excessive privileges and threat vectors need to be re uh, removed. And you know, the nice thing about this is it's not a product, it's a concept, it's an idea, right? It's a model. So, and I think it's one which in cybersecurity, a lot of people can easily grasp and that's a big thing to get adoption of security principles if people can understand what you're doing and support you in doing that so um you know in this particular statistic we have from a survey 59 percent of organizations were deploying a zero trust strategy so we know it's very popular today so what i want to do is just show a couple of examples on here on how you can do it because often people talk about the network access component and uh, authentication components which are very important but there's also other um, uh, ways that you can improve the security. So I talked about the retailer example earlier um, about how they use a hypervisor-based environment to um, uh, reduce their cost of operations because within one um, device, they could have what was would previously have eight different uh, one-rack unit appliances in their data center. But also the, the this type of solution um, uh, helps give uh, strong isolation uh, to an organization out there. So we partnered with Dell. Dell is one, an OEM partner of ours where we have our Thunder MVP platform. And this uses Dell hardware, and you can even use the Dell Open Manager components in here, et cetera. Uh, but the, we can then uh, layer on in the hypervisor up to eight different uh, um, infrastructure appliances. So it could be application delivery. It could be DTLS decryption. Um, appliances to look to decrypt traffic for security devices. Uh, it could be carrier grade NAT functionality to expand, extend IPv4 and help um, bridge to IPv6. So very, very flexible. And in this particular example, um, the organization wanted to deploy this and reduce their costs and have that centralized management. So they basically enhanced their, their CISO's zero trust security model by deploying this and running multiple different appliances on it. Yet still linking into their Dell standardized environment and use it, being able to use their uh, standard management tools out there. So it's a very elegant solution to reduce that complexity and also reduce cost and um, then deliver the solution in, in a simple day-to-day -day fashion. Um, one other thing I also want to talk about, when we talk about zero trust, it's, it is also protecting flows in the network, just not, not just the authentication piece. And you know, when we look at this, there's so much traffic going on. And when we see 5G, IoT, and all these other things going on, trying to find um, attacks can be like a needle in a haystack. So we really need to think differently on how we secure things. And one of the, the biggest things to me, which makes the most sense, is looking at artificial intelligence and machine learning to be able to identify um, uh, attacks which are coming in. So we have um, a solution called Zero Day Automated Protection where we look at multiple different characteristics of, of traffic and then we can create filters if the feature is turned on to uh, block these uh, unknown attacks 
um, in a very quick manner. And we've had uh, some of the largest gaming companies in the world who use us who have come back and blocked 50 million packet per second attacks uh, multiple times with these type of things, up to 200 gigabits per second in one case, uh, I'm actively thinking on here. But the idea of this is that you use artificial uh, intelligence and machine learning to be able to find things which would, you know, you know, it could be done manually, but in reality, it wouldn't have been done because there's too much to do. So that ended those top four elements. But you know, as we uh, as we know, technology is always evolving. So there's always uh, other things on the horizon. You know, people are looking at Kubernetes right now. People are looking at deploying capture for enterprise solutions, uh, just like you see in the in the uh, the standard public sites to verify users. So there's a lot of other factors out there as well. Now, with that, I'll just wrap up and uh, just give a sh very short overview of A10 so we can go to questions. But with A10, we have industry-leading solutions in four different areas, uh, which is application delivery, uh, 5G security, including carrier-grade net, uh, DDoS protection with our Thunder TPS appliance, and then traffic visibility for, you know, for example, like Digital Guardian or Cisco devices, et cetera. Uh, and this is all wrapped up with automation and control with our A10 Harmony controller, which uh, is available for our products. And when we look at our customer base, so who's who are some of the largest organizations out there? Uh, Microsoft is one of our biggest customers. We have eight of the top 12 gaming companies who use us as an example. And then a slew of enterprises you can see on here from Morgan Stanley to Caesars to University of California, et cetera. And you know, just to wrap this up, we started off talking about digital transformation and digital resiliency. And you know, digital resiliency really, to me, is something which you know can make organisations be successful. Digital transformation might be one of those things which uh, there might be some longer term roadmaps. Digital resiliency is obviously one of those things you have to respond to in the near term. So you know, we often, we always say to organisations is evaluate these modernisation techniques and see how they can help you and relieve pain points you have. Um, for your business. The other thing is also because technology is always changing is to plan for these technology shifts. Some you have to do now, like the TLS decryption technologies, you have to do now, otherwise you're going to suffer consequences like Google ranks, uh, organizations who aren't using the latest uh, encryption techniques lower than others in Google searches, as an example. But some of the other technologies might require a longer horizon if you're moving to Kubernetes or some of the cloud environments or you have a, a greater plan out there. Um, so come Coming up with that roadmap for yourself is obviously an important thing. So with that, I think we have Howard back. Um, uh, let me uh, pass on. Hello, Paul. Thank you. And thank you for jumping. You know, good news, it happened at the best possible time. <laughs> I don't know right why you shut us down, but I, I was on my last slide, and quite frankly, my last slide was boring. So it's good that you jumped in when you did, and uh, I appreciate it. Uh, we are back with some questions. Um, the first one, um, I, somebody wanted to hear a little more, uh, a little more granularity about your analytics console. Okay, yeah. So with the analytics out there, um, I think I covered it towards the end there. But the um, the, the difference uh, from what we had before is, I mean, literally there was. I mean, if we're really honest, it was it was wasn't really analytics. It was just reporting on connection counts. Now we, you know, there's a con convergence of a couple of different things in the analytics console. One, you can connect into multiple different form factors. You can connect into multiple different clouds. Um, you can then also drill down and get. Um, a, a lot more information down to the page level and not just the connection count, which is what you traditionally associate with the application delivery controller and the load balancing platform. And then finally, it's that connected intelligence where we can leverage other pieces of technology to give more interesting results out there. And what I mean, the best example I gave earlier is the, um, you know, the, or simplest, one of the simpler ones is that geolocation. So that on a map, you can actually see, you know, where your connections are coming from. Like in our DDoS solution, you can look at the uh, console in there. And if you suddenly see there's a, a lot of traffic coming from Russia and you're a community college in New Mexico, there's probably mm. something wrong. Right, unless someone's promoting yeah. and trying to get students from there, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Olivia, we just have a question. Uh, I know you mentioned that the recording of this session will be available. Uh, will, will the slides be available? Yes, we can definitely shoot over the slides in the with the recording so everyone has those for reference. Fantastic. Thank you very much. We just 
got that question. Another question that just popped up near the end, uh, Paul, was about DDoS. Apparently, uh, somebody wanted to hear more about it. Uh, wanted you to expand upon your, your DDoS. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I skimmed over that one a little bit, so that, that question makes sense. So, the uh, you know, when we look at DDoS protection, I mean, it, is, it is a you know, I won't say multi-device, but you know, all infrastructure point, uh, all infrastructure solutions probably should have some type of DDoS protection. Like our carrier grade NAT protection has protection for DDoS, uh, sorry, for IPv4 pools in it. DDoS protection specifically for that. The application delivery controller has some built-in uh, DDoS protection elements, but when you're really managing a large network, you want to do network-wide protection, and that's where our Thunder TPS uh, solution comes in, which is a dedicated solution for it. So I talked about artificial intelligence and machine learning, which I think is one of the big innovations, but there's also things in there where you can have um, you know, a threat intelligence solution, which actually comes with our product, mm -hmm where we have up to 50 different, well, over 50 different sources where we create lists where you can bot, you can uh, block things like botnet drones, et cetera. So known bad IPs or bad actors can be blocked automatically, which just makes sense. And then we can escalate through a policy uh, depending if you're in peacetime or if you're in wartime, obviously going into wartime um, out there. And it can be there effective. We had one um, hosting provider, LeaseWeb, in Holland who they implemented the solution um, and they actually said 11% of their tickets, uh, support tickets went down. So DDoS is a real problem for a lot of organizations and looking at it network wide is really the way uh, a lot of the uh, larger organizations do today. Excellent. Okay, one, uh, one more question. Um, you mentioned Kubernetes. Somebody's asking if you support Kubernetes um, and what other non-hardware options do you offer? Yeah, I mean, we don't care if someone buys hardware or software, to be honest, because it's basically the solution you're trying to uh, deliver. So, you know, we have our hardware appliances, which are very popular. Obviously, it's turnkey and it's traditional. Uh, but we also have versions which the different form factors include hypervisor versions from Red Hat to uh, to uh, um, uh, VMware, uh, ESXi, et cetera, bare metal options, containerized versions, um, and then cloud marketplace versions with Azure, uh, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, AWS. So it's the same software running on each one of those instances. So that way, that, you know, for example, like the Harmony Controller, the APIs, and things of that nature. Uh, can support all of those. Um, and we do support, um, you know, Docker-based containers, and you can manage those with Kubernetes um, as well. So uh, definitely an option, and I, a lot of organizations are looking at those um, coming up as well. Excellent. Paul, I want to thank you. That This has been a, a great, very informative session, and I think you've offered our audience some terrific solutions to the kinds of problems I was talking about. Um, also, I just want to point out, we have an awesome audience, and several members of the audience popped uh, a thank you to you into the uh, question and answer console. So on behalf of all of us here uh, at Redmond Mag and, 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 and for A10, thank you very much for that. You're very, very welcome. Um, if you have ideas for future sessions, we'd love to hear from you. Um, we try to bring as much value as we can every time. And with that, uh, we'll say have a good rest of the day. And Olivia, I'll hand it back to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Howard and Paul, for being with us today. That was I knew we were in for a great presentation, and you both definitely delivered on just a phenomenal presentation. So we thank you for your time today. Um, and thank you, most importantly, A10 Networks for sponsoring and making this possible today. We really appreciate it. And everyone, keep an eye out, like we said, for the – re-record links so that you can re-watch it or share it with a colleague. You know it was a lot of great info. With that, everyone, have a great rest of your day, and we look forward to catching you on the next one.